Hello and welcome to our Art and Architecture webinar series. I'm Kurt T. Camillo, the Curator of Fine Art at American Ancestors and the New England Historic and Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator and virtual MC for today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We're the oldest and largest genealogical society in the world. We specialize in providing resources, research, and expertise that uncover the stories of families, family objects, and family homes. We are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Historic preservation is not synonymous with resistance to change, but rather it's a proven strategy for enhancing vibrancy and contributing to quality of life. We can find solutions to the problems of today by understanding, studying, and preserving the past. Ben Cipolla, president and CEO of Historic New England, will tell us today how preservation can help build resilient communities that culturally, economically, and environmentally contribute to a more full and equitable future. If you have questions, please feel free at any time to type them into the question panel at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. I also wanna note that we are broadcasting from our homes to yours with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end and thank you for your patience. If we do lose connection, you will have access to a full recording on our website that you can watch at any time. Ben Cipolla was appointed the president and CEO of Historic New England in June of 2020. And I just wanna say as a sidebar, Historic New England is the largest owner of historic homes in America. One of the many things we're very proud of here in New England. Ben is a former president and CEO of the National Park Foundation and the former president and CEO of the Municipal Art Society of New York the oldest and largest preservation organization in New York City. At Lincoln Center, Ben served as the executive director of David Geffen Hall, the home of the New York Philharmonic, and as a senior advisor to the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. He is a past chairman and president of the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, chairman of the Arts Arena Paris, and vice chairman of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Ben has also served on the executive committees of many organizations, including the National Women's History Museum and Ballet Hispanico. In the private sector, he was a president and CEO at Fidelity Capital and a founder and CEO at a number of startup companies in media and philanthropic services. Ben is also a professor at the Columbia Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation. That is a mouthful to say. Please, everybody, join me in welcoming the wonderful Ben. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is really great to be with you. And first, my thanks to uh, NEHGS for having me. It's, it, it, uh, it's a real treat, uh, given that I'm still new in my post at Historic New England. It's a thrill uh, to be with this very special community uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you to Ginevra for running the show uh, this afternoon. And a most very special thank you to Kurt for inviting me and for moderating this event. You do such amazing work and have engaged so many in connecting with our cultural history. It's a real privilege and, privilege and honor to be with you, Kurt, and uh, thank you again. At the most basic level, we need our place, our neighborhood, our town, our spot in this world to be resilient, environmentally, culturally, economically, and socially. Really, all that means is that we want to live in healthy, enjoyable, livable, sustainable, equitable communities. And New England is so abundant in having all the ingredients for resilience and livability at its fingertips. We have historic fabric, an astonishing coastline, forests, fields, water, it's worth repeating, water, deep roots in innovation, entrepreneurship, diversity that deepens and strengthens us, the most robust network of educational resources in the nation, arguably in the world, it's all right here. Studying, understanding, and preserving the past is essential to unlocking, leveraging, and expanding our great strengths as a region. We're better for understanding and applying the principles of land use and architect, ar agriculture employed by inhabitants here for thousands of years, sustaining rich and fertile soil. We're stronger for unlocking and amplifying the stories of everyone contributing to the, to the building of our communities, not just the wealthy or the privileged, but everyone. We're stronger for engaging with our past as we develop plans for the future, valuing, balancing the old and new. When we think of the built places we love, 
Most often there is a mix of old buildings, new use to, uses, juxtaposition, energy, great architecture, beauty, and a connection to nature. Affordable housing, resistance to climate change, accessible open space, fresh and healthy food. These are some of the attributes that make a community desirable, inclusive, and prepared for the future. We truly can find solutions to the problems that threaten these attributes by understanding and preserving the past. That's where historic preservation comes in. I'd like to say it's a way forward, one of our greatest tools, one of our brightest lights in thinking about how to build more resilient communities. Historic preservation, unfortunately, has often been associated with resistance to change. That doesn't in any way have to be so. Historic preservation, its core principles of valuing history, place, human connectivity and energy, livability, sustainability, is one of today's most exciting solutions for taking on the challenges that face us. I'm hoping to share a little bit this afternoon about the dynamic scope of historic New England. It's a real treasure, as I'm sure many of you know, and with our partners across the preservation field, we offer so much to think about and work with as we look for resilient and successful solutions. So in a typical year, more than 200,000 people visit historic New England's collection of 38 historic homes and farms. From our founding in 1910, when we were known as the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, historic New England has been committed to a vision of preserving life as it's lived by everyday people. I'm excited to share with you the lessons of historic preservation, lessons that can help promote affordable housing, fight climate change, and make for healthier, more livable communities. I'll also share the ways in which historic New England is working hard to make preservation more inclusive and enrich our cultural fabric with a broader lens on the past. First, let's talk about historic New England's collections and why they are so important. There's no organization in the United States that's as comprehensive in its approach to preserving an entire region's history. This begins with our collection of 38 historic properties open to the public, each with its own unique story. Historic New England's property collection spans four centuries, including not only the oldest wood frame house in New Hampshire, Portsmouth Jackson House built in 1664, but also the 1938 home of Bauhaus founder Walter Gropius in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Our historic farms, including Casey Farm and Watson Farm, overlooking Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, maintain some of the agricultural traditions set by indigenous people centuries before the arrival of European settlers. No matter which historic property you visit or which era is represented, the New England spirit of innovation is apparent wherever you may go. The objects that fill these houses are a crucial part of the story. Historic New England has amassed the most comprehensive collection of the region's domestic objects, more than 150,000, half of which are on view in the homes in which they were used. Although the collection includes works of art by the likes of Gilbert Stewart, John Singleton Copley, and Henry Moore, it's the everyday items that form its backbone from furniture to clothing to cookware. We also hold one of the two largest collections of historic wallpaper in the United States. Our object collections are so extensive that we need an entire building to preserve and care for the pieces that aren't on view to the public. Historic New England's regional office in Haverhill, Massachusetts is an eight story former shoe factory devoted largely to the conservation and care of these objects. And beyond those objects, Historic New England holds a vast collection of primary sources in its library and archives. Our founder, William Sumner Appleton, was a voracious collector of images, postcards, ephemera, architectural drawings, and most importantly, photographs. The archival collection paints a fascinating portrait of rural and urban New England from the 19th century to today. Verna Reed's famed photographs for Life magazine, photographs of the construction of the Boston subway system, and the collection of architect Royal Barry Wills, the father of the Cape Cod House, are among the highlights. We also have an extraordinary collection of work by New England's 19th century women photographers, uh, including Emma Lewis Coleman and Mary H. North End. This archival collection is growing every day, capturing history as it happens with recent acquisitions such as photographer Catherine Taylor's portraits 
of Bostonians during the COVID-19 pandemic and John D. Wolfe's capturing of, Ch of Boston's Chinatown. The Historic New England Library and Archives is an extraordinary resource for authors, students, filmmakers, researchers, and businesses throughout the region and the nation, telling the most complete story of life in New England over the centuries. It has taken 111 years to build this organization's holdings, and to understand how that happened, we have to go to the birth of the historic preservation movement in Boston. In 1863, a community effort to save John Hancock's house in Beacon Hill from demolition was unsuccessful. Bostonians realized that they would need to make a proactive plan to ensure the survival of other historically significant locations in the city. William Sumner Appleton is considered the country's first professional preservationist, an avid collector who kept detailing scrapbooks for all of his activities. He was a natural convert to the burgeoning preservation movement. In 1905, he worked to ensure the successful preservation of the Paul Revere House in Boston's North End. In 1909, after learning of plans to significantly alter an 18th century house that was important to the story of the Battle of Lexington, he decided to establish a nonprofit organization, the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, now known as Historic New England. The organization was established in 1910. In the following year, Sweat Isley House, a former 17th century tavern, in Newbury, Massachusetts became its first property acquisition. In 1916, the organization acquired Harris Gray Otis House in Boston at the foot of Beacon Hill. Both Otis House and Swite Isley House remain open to the public for tours today. For sure, the ethics and principles that guided the early preservation movement are still relevant today and preservation can provide solutions to contemporary problems that face our communities. In the middle of the 20th century, the preservationist and activist Jane Jacobs organized to stop cities from demolishing old buildings in the name of urban renewal. This quotation from her 1961 book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, illustrates why. She foresaw that the demolition of modest housing was accessible, that was accessible to low and middle income citizens would result in the affordability crisis that we see in major cities now, as we know. This crisis of affordable housing plagues many New England cities today. According to a recent study by the Boston Indicators Project, 14% of renters in Massachusetts were behind on rent, with Black and Latinx renters more likely to fall behind. Exacerbated by the pandemic, the number of families experiencing homelessness in Boston rose by nearly 9% from 2019 to 2020. Uh, two. I had the uh, great honor of uh, presiding over um, a program uh, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation um, uh, in honor of uh, Jane's uh, important work. Uh, it was called the Jane Jacobs Medal, and uh, there were there was an incredible diverse range of recipients over the years, uh, from uh, including Robert De Niro uh, and the um, formation of the Tri Tribeca Film Festival in response to 9/11. Uh, to Roseanne Haggerty, uh, a MacArthur genius, uh, uh, and uh, a real leader in uh, solutions for the homelessness. And uh, Jacob's work really, uh, all these years later, uh, really does continue to influence uh, the urban planning field. Um, cities such as Boston, Worcester, New Bedford, and others have assets such as the Three Decker House built in the late 19th century to accommodate multiple families uh, in dense neighborhoods. As luxury condos continue to rise in greater Boston and some cities and towns make it difficult to build anything other than single family homes, the Three Decker can provide a historical model for the type of modest high density housing that can keep working people in the region. Historic New England has convened preservation leaders and students from around the region to discuss preservation of Three Deckers and other types of middle income housing and has included plans to expand on this work and our five-year strategic agenda. There may be no other challenges threatening uh, to our communities here in New England as climate change. We saw the effects throughout this extremely hot, wet summer. Everyone must do their part to reduce the use of fossil fuels if we are to avoid the catastrophic effects of this worsening crisis. For nearly a decade, historic New England has made it a priority to cut energy use at all of our historic properties, all while adhering to our preservation philosophy that prioritizes use of original material. At the Lyman Estate in Waltham, Massachusetts, originally built 
1793 and where I am today as, as, uh, uh, as a part of this presentation, uh, we cut energy use by more than 50% thanks to consistent testing and energy audits, air sealing and insulation, converting fuel from oil to gas, improving duct work and installing smart thermostats and buying energy efficient equipment for the house's catering kitchen. At the 1683 Pierce House in Dorchester, one of the oldest houses standing in the city of Boston and a busy site for our school programs, repointing the foundation to reduce airflow and installing storm windows were enough to cut energy use by 30%. These findings and more on promoting energy efficiency in old houses are available in a white paper at historicnewengland.org slash white papers. What you're seeing in the photograph is uh, an, ed an energy auditor might use blower doors, uh, a fan that helps demonstrate how much the building is leaking air, uh, or they might use infrared cameras that help pinpoint otherwise undetectable areas of air leakage and, uh, and heat loss. And we are very much engaged constantly in that kind of analysis. Uh, the way old houses are built can teach us a lot about conservation and smart energy use. We must act now to ensure that they withstand the effects of climate change. Uh, in this video, it's a very quick clip, but informative. Uh, ben Havoc, Historic New England's team leader for property care, tells us more. Uh, when they had these houses, they didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have central heating systems. They opened the windows. They figured out ways to not use fossil fuels for um, their, their properties. And we opened the front and rear door of a, a main central hall house and the whole, the whole building ventilates the way it did 200 years ago, still works today. And you can really learn something from that. You can learn how to design more sustainably. You can learn how to live uh, more sustainably and with um, you know, more thought towards how everything interacts, nature and the structure. And of course, preservation is about a lot more than just taking care of old buildings. Landscape preservation is an essential part of livable communities. During the pandemic, we have been reminded that welcoming open outdoor space for the public to enjoy isn't a nicety, it's a necessity. And historic New England rises to that challenge by preserving over 1,300 acres of gardens, farmland, fields, and forests across the region, all accessible to the public. Open space preservation and accessibility are essential to the region's children who need safe outdoor space to learn and play. At historic sites like Casey Farm in Saunderstown, Rhode Island, and Spencer Pierce Little Farm in Newbury, Massachusetts, tens of thousands of children each year experience historic landscapes and learn about animals, food, and the environment. One of the additional environmental benefits to conservation uh, of historic landscapes is that it helps biodiversity. More than a quarter of New England's wildflower species have become extinct in the last 150 years. Loss of plant species damages our ecosystems and threatens the animals that rely on them. These landscapes are also home to animal species including heritage breed chickens at Casey Farm and foster farm animals from donkeys to horses to pigs at Spencer Pierce Little Farm. In Rhode Island, Project Chick combines a visit to Casey Farm to see its heritage breed chickens with an opportunity to hatch baby chicks back in the classroom. The program is so popular that nearly every child in the Ocean State has participated in it by the time they finish school. Historic landscapes provide space for sustainable agriculture and food production. At our two Rhode Island farms, we are strongly committed to locally produced organic foods. Casey Farm in Saunderstown operates a community supported agriculture program and hosts a weekly market for local farmers. Watson Farm in Jamestown raises grass fed heritage breed cattle and sheep. Finally, in an increasingly homogenized world, Preservation can help communities maintain the characteristics that make them unique. Historic New England's preservation easement program is a national model, protecting 116 privately owned properties from houses and farms to churches and landscapes from significant alteration or neglect. Our team works with cities and towns throughout the region to advise on local preservation strategy that protects important buildings well before the wrecking ball is in play. Now, if historic preservation can do so much for us, 
why does it suffer from a bit of a reputation problem? Historically, the focus on preserving property naturally privileges those who were in a position to own it. Therefore, preservation organizations, including Historic New England, have built collections of properties named after wealthy men of European descent. Of course, these individuals were more likely to leave an archival record of their personal and professional lives than the working class, immigrants, and people of color. Early preservation efforts did often reflect a bit of a nativist streak. The colonial revival movement of this era, which is represented in historic New England's properties such as Phillips House in Salem, Mass, was an expression of the still young nation's nostalgia for the revolutionary era. It also sparked the preservation of many landmarks that we greatly value today. The challenge facing us is to explain and demonstrate the enormous value that historic preservation can bring to our communities holistically, far beyond saving and treasuring great houses. And in fact, for years, Historic New England has identified stories in our collection that broaden the range of identities represented in our history. I am excited to share some examples of these stories with you, along with a plan to broaden the lens through which history is shared at our historic sites. One way to acknowledge a fuller perspective of the New England experience is to reach further into the past and include the perspectives of the ind indigenous people who lived here before European settlement. At Casey Farm in Saunderstown, Rhode Island, that means partnering with indigenous artists and organizations to provide a platform to their perspective for those uh, who visit the farm. Um, this summer, we installed the sculpture Three Sisters, Rain Keep by Allison Newsom and Deborah Spears Moorhead. It honors the indigenous heritage of the land and the lessons of sustainability and harmony with nature that this heritage teaches. The piece tells the Eastern Woodlands creation story of the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, which grow near the sculpture, where, uh, near where the sculpture is installed. The upper canopy of the sculpture collects dew and rain, which flows downward into a 500 gallon rain barrel. Uh, gardeners and children at Casey Farm Programs draw water from its spigot to nurture the garden beds, even as they absorb the story uh, that it tells. In the farmhouse, a display combines Narragansett artifacts discovered during archaeology at the farm with contemporary objects made by indigenous artists. 200-year-old shoe soles found in the walls of the farmhouse lie near deerskin moccasins made in, in 2018 by artist Silver Moon LaRose for her son. The Tomaquag Museum, dedicated to educating the public about indigenous history and culture, has been our invaluable partner in this effort to decolonize Casey Farm. Here, museum director Lauren Spears describes the significance of the farm to the Narragansett people. Part of the reason we did the partnership with Casey Farm was to decolonize the space and to remind people that not only were we here, but we're still here, and that indigenous people are connected to this place, even as it's being occupied by others. Another important aspect of telling the fullest New England story is acknowledging the range of sexual identity among those who lived in the past. Historic New England has been a leader in presenting the life stories of people who today would likely identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. In Gloucester, Massachusetts, Beauport, the Sleeper McCann House is the labyrinth home of one of America's first professional interior designers, Henry Davis Sleeper. Sleeper was part of an energetic social circle in the exclusive Eastern Point neighborhood overlooking Gloucester Harbor. Because Sleeper was a gay man who never married or had children, the story of Beauport upends the traditional house museum structure of a large family and its descendants. At Beauport, home is a place for groups of friends, including Isabella Stewart Gardner and painter Cecilia Bow to gather. Sleeper's correspondence with close friend A. Pied Andrew who later served as a member of the US House of Representatives, paints a vivid portrait of their social life. Meanwhile, in South Berwick, Maine, 
the home of Sarah Orne Jewett draws visitors to learn about the life of a 19th century novelist. Recently, historic New England reinterpreted the museum experience to include the story of Jewett's relationship with writer and philanthropist Annie Adams Fields. After Fields' husband died, she began a decades long relationship with Jewett. Although Adams rarely accompanied Jewett to her South Berwick home, the two moved through late 19th century Boston as a couple. Again, written correspondence provides tremendous insight into the relationships between people who lived more than a century ago. Let's hear an excerpt of a letter from Sarah Orne Jewett to Annie Adams Fields. Dear love, I'm so often sending you messages and I hope the little white mother don't forget them by the way. Are you sure you know how much I love you? If you don't, I can't tell you, but I think of you and think of you and I'm always being reminded of you. I am yours most lovingly, S.O.J. It's a point of pride for historic New England that scholars of LGBTQ plus history use both Beauport and Sarah Orne Jewett House as resources for understanding how sexual identity was perceived in the past. We began hosting special tours of these museums for Pride Month several years ago uh, and partnered with Boston's History Project, which documents LGBTQ plus history on special talks and tours. The lives of Black New Englanders are chronically underrepresented in New England's historic sites. Organizations that share 19th century history are grappling with how to interpret the region's complicated relationship to slavery. At Sayward Wheeler House in York Harbor, Maine, Historic New England recently introduced a new tour experience that focuses the story of the house, not just on the wealthy Sayward family, but on the black and indigenous people they enslaved in the 18th century, Prince, Cato, Dinah, and Benito. Just over the New Hampshire border in Portsmouth, the home of Governor John Langdon is an exemplar of high style Georgian architecture and a testament to the city's revolutionary era wealth. But some of its most compelling stories involve the challenges of living as a black American in a nation where slavery, slavery still thrived in many parts of the country. When 22 year old Ona Judge escaped enslavement from the home of President George and Martha Washington, the executive mansion uh, in Philadelphia, uh, she sought refuge in New Hampshire. Then Senator Langdon's daughter Elizabeth recognized her and spread the word. Although the Fugitive Slave Act had been passed three years earlier in 1793, some scholars believe that Senator Langdon may have sent warning to judge out of deference to the growing abolitionist sentiment of his constituents. By the time the authorities came to look for her in Portsmouth, she had fled to Greenland, New Hampshire and was able to even evade capture uh, for the rest of her life. Oni Judge's story uh, has received renewed visibility in recent years, in part due to the book Never Caught uh, by Erica Armstrong Dunbar. Every visitor to Langdon House learns about this important story, which portrays our nation's first president in a somewhat less rever reverential light than uh, some may be accustomed to. Um, a lack of documentation about the lives of Black Americans, whether they were free or enslaved, presents a challenge for centering their stories in historical narratives. At Langdon House, we came up with a creative way to include the story of Cyrus Bruce, a freedman who worked for John Langdon and was known for his impeccable fashion sense. As part of an artist in residence program at Langdon House, artist Richard Haynes Jr. worked with the community to create a visual representation of this black man whose story had gone untold. In his painting, he left the details of Bruce's face undefined as a symbol of those whose stories have been lost to history. Let's hear from the artist about the significance of this project. As we look at the image, Cyrus Bruce stands at that door. You could see that he has respect for himself. The community had respect for him. He was well-dressed, eloquently dressed and had a strong character. Therefore, Cyrus Bruce, even without a face, is officially visible to society today. Cyrus Bruce 
So how does an organization whose primary connection with the public is through historic homes overcome the fact that home ownership was often available only to the privileged few? We've taken two approaches. We launched 100 Years 100 Communities, a project dedicated to partnering with communities beyond our collection of historic sites for special programs and collaborative projects. This initiative generated online exhibitions, oral history projects, and award-winning documentary films. And we launched Everyone's History, a series dedicated to sharing stories of 20th and 21st century history in New England. On this slide, you see a current project, More Than a Market, which chronicles the immigrant-owned markets of Burlington and Winooski, Vermont, markets that took an increased importance to their neighborhoods uh, during uh, the pandemic. And in We Are Haverhill, Changing Faces of Haverhill's Neighborhoods, photographer Markham Starr shot black and white portraits of Haverhill, Massachusetts, which were paired with oral history interviews chronicling how they came to view the city as home. This was an important project for us because it helped strengthen the bond between our organization and one of, one of its home communities. As I mentioned earlier, Haverhill is the home of our collection storage and conservation center and a focus of our new strategic plan as we imagine the potential for the complex to take on a broader public educational and civic role and purpose. Also part of everyone's history, the Haymarket Project chronicles the diverse array of vendors that make up Boston's centuries old open air market, which continues to provide low cost food to the public and withstand constant surrounding development. This project resulted in a documentary film, a photography exhibition, a book from Arcadia Publishing, a virtual lecture, and of course, walking tours. The second approach to preservation of cultural history involves a comprehensive rethinking and reinvest reinvestigation of the stories we tell at historic New England's houses and farms. I'm thrilled to talk about the launch of a multi-year historic New England project, Recovering New England Voices. The voices we amplify and the perspectives we privilege uh, influence the present and the future. In this time of social unrest and redefinition, historical narratives are more important uh, than ever. A complete understanding of the past is the first step in building a more equitable society. As a leading voice for New England's history, Historic New England is launching Recovering New England's Voices to challenge traditional narratives and promote healing community collaboration and inspiration. Using research, art, storytelling, and technology, we're creating spaces that amplify marginalized voices. Our sites will become catalysts, we hope, for transformative conversations and environments for socially driven things that do need to be talked about and addressed. The biases that have shaped our storytelling over the past century are not unique, of course, to historic New England. Museums and preservation organizations are amid a great reckoning, and historic night historic site experiences are rapidly losing relevancy. Um, those of us in this field uh, know how this is so. The public no longer accepts incomplete histories that only focus on one group of people. Um, uh, recovering New England's voices empowers communities to share their own stories and create historic site experiences representing all perspectives uh, in this storied region. In the past, uh, the owner's name associated with a historic site controlled the narrative. Uh, in the future, Historic New England hopes to define our sites by a fuller scope of the most compelling stories, not only their wealthiest owners. Recovering New England's voices is divided into three phases, research, reform, and relaunch. And we're thrilled to announce that this robust research initiative uh, has very much begun. Uh, we've brought on full-time year-long research scholars. Uh, these scholars represent the largest single investment in new research on historic properties that Historic New England has made uh, in decades. We at Historic New England in the field of public history know that this work is long overdue. Uh, we can no longer accept incomplete histories or stories that have been erased, suppressed, and ignored uh, in the past. Our work is not done until everyone can see their own story and our interpretation of New England's history. Uh, today's talk is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you can find uh, at Historic New England. Uh, I hope I provided uh, uh, some clear examples of how the principles of preservation can strengthen our cultural fabric and promote resilient communities. 
I hope that you are compelled to find out more. Please visit historicnewengland.org and sign up for our email list, become a member, get free access to all of our sites while supporting our mission. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. There are so many stories left to share about this region we call home. Thank you. Wow, Vin, thank you so much. That was an incredibly inspirational presentation. Let's get to your questions, everybody. Go ahead and type your query into the question panel at the bottom of the screen, and we will answer as many as we can in the time provided. I'm gonna start off with the first one, which was how do we convince younger adults to care about preservation? And are you, Vin, optimistic about the future of historic preservation in New England? Thank you very much, Kurt, and thank you again for inviting me today. And uh, as everybody can see, we are uh, we're very matchy-matchy with our white shirts and blue blazers in classes today. The, um, uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I, think that, uh, uh, I think that younger New Englanders, I think that younger, younger Americans are already on the program. Uh, I think this next generation, these next generations really do very largely get it. Uh, they um, have come to appreciate the importance of community. They've been forced to uh, because of the uh, pandemic. Uh, I have found in my work, and, I, I've, and as a teacher, I have found that, uh, that young people are, are very inclined to, to, um, uh, to like uh, old stuff, um, to want to be in places that have uh, history and character, uh, um, understand almost uh, prenatally adaptive reuse, you know, taking something and making it cool and hip. And, uh, and I think... Um, I think it's a very exciting time, and, um, and I do feel very optimistic. I think uh, it's incumbent upon us in the historic preservation field to, to um, um, you know, throw the, uh, the line out, uh, put up the bridge. Um, uh, we, have, um, uh, we have felt exclusive. Uh, we have felt elitist. Uh, we haven't uh, worked hard enough uh, to, uh, to connect um, across uh, uh, diverse communities uh, to... to uh, to connect more uh, with uh, younger folks. Um, the education programs uh, at Historic New England are amazing and incredibly important. And, uh, and in our new uh, strategic plan, we have a mandate uh, to take uh, the programs that we invest in, which are very heavily um, focused on the Boston area and really expand them across the region. So uh, I'm very optimistic. That's very really good to hear because um, I, am not probably as optimistic as you, probably just about life in general. But um, for instance, I compare it like so much of what I do with what's going on in Britain. And it astonishes me when I go around um, houses that are open to the public in Britain, which are like about a thousand, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, and I see time after time, eight-year-olds in groups from schools coming by. And what I see in America is that you don't get a lot of interest in the general public unless it's Mount Vernon or Monticello or basically what I call someone that lived here famous house. And in Britain, you find an appreciation for the house because it's an important house, because the collections are there, because it's a story. I remember I went to this one house in um, Dorset called Kingston Lacey that um, school children are going through dressed up in 17th century costumes that they had each made themselves. Like I followed them and listened to them talking. And what, what worries me is we don't have that same inculcation of history in our schools and among our young people. And obviously, as we are all tired of hearing, if we don't get young people involved, we're, we're hoped, we're, there is no hope. Well, it's very much on us, which is what you're underscoring. And, uh, and I think that, that, um, that we do uh, institutions such as Historic New England, uh, we have to work harder and uh, on, um, on really um, uh, making uh, uh, accessibility to our sites uh, compelling and, um, and finding the language that uh, connects and relates to, uh, to broader audiences. And I think, we're doing, I think we're beginning to do that and I think there are some good, uh, good results. And I think that's the key thing, compelling. It doesn't have to be a famous person. It just, it can tell a story that's regional. And as a matter of fact, I think particularly here where I live in Jamaica Plain, the section of Boston that I live in, um, our only historic house, the Loring Bino house, which was for years drifting by almost unseen, has become very much a part of the community because even though it's a historic house, it's become a center for community activity because it's not just, it happens to be a house that hosts a community. And you see so much, pride among people who live in JP 
because this is their historic house. And, and that kind of thing, that, that integration, taking historic houses out of the realm of old white rich ladies who say, oh, no, don't touch that. Um, and that came from George Washington. It's like, that's good. That's a great story, but we need to tell more stories. And speaking of that, I have a question that's just popped in that perfectly dovetails for this. Karen says, I'm a descendant of Colonel John Ashley of Ashley Falls. Can you do more projects like the Ashley property where they tell the story of the mum that Elizabeth Freeman, the slave who won her freedom with the help of Judge Theodore Sedg Sedgwick? Does that oh, ring yes. yes, I mean, I think that that's very, very important uh, to raise. And that's exactly what, um, uh, what we are um, developing with Re Recovering New England's Voices. And, uh, and we have a lot of um, wonderful seeds and kernels of information, even within historic New England uh, and across many of our sites, but we have, but, but the information is very shallow and we need to do the deep forensic work, the hard work on getting more and not waiting for some epiphany or some great event uh, to begin to put uh, the information out there, but to start to influence our, our visitor experience and our, and our narratives uh, today. And, uh, and so this is very much underway. I cited some examples in what I said earlier. There are many other examples that I could, that I could cite. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a, obviously a very key priority for us. I just wanted to go back, Kurt, to, to, to reference uh, something that you were, we were just saying about um, attracting younger generations. And it's Spencer Pierce Little that I had mentioned. We have a rescue animal program there. And uh, it is a brilliant, it's brilliant. And, um, and it's entirely volunteer run. And of course it's a magnet for kids and not just uh, you know, 10 year olds, but 50 year olds. I mean, kids of all ages of uh, who love animals and uh, you know, first visit the animals, then visit the house, then understand what went on there. Uh, and then learn something about uh, sustainability uh, and a salt water marsh. I mean, there's a, um, it's just all a way in, right? We've got to provide these uh, opportunities for um, uh, uh, get, getting into the conversation. And then once there, you know, I have a lot of faith in people that they will, uh, and the natural curiosity of human beings, that they'll, uh, the discoveries will continue. I, I could not agree with you more about the way in part, particularly because, and the incremental change, because I think um, in modern society, and maybe particularly in America, there's this focus of, there has to be a home run. We have to say, we found you know, Captain John's gold buried in the backyard and then the world's media is at your doorstep. Not that that wouldn't be great, but that smaller stories can be just as rewarding and, and it teaches us that it doesn't have to be something that's a home run every time, that these small stories and how they incrementally build up and what they tell us about ourselves and our culture are ultimately more satisfying than those, those big splashy things that would get splashed all over the media. Let me say splash one more time. Um, so, I have, some, I, have a, I have a compliment for you here from Robert, who says that amazing Jane Jacobs quote is the most compelling and succinct warning, warning about what became Urban Renewal's tragic focus on raising blighted neighborhoods that I've ever encountered. Thanks so much for including it. And I have, been, a, I have been devoted to the work of Jane Jacobs since I was 17 years old. And, uh, and I have, I, it's so interesting, all of, these, all of these years going back to uh, her uh, her, uh, her writings, um, you know, she was not at all popular uh, in the academic urban planning field. Mm -hmm. She remember. did not like historic preservationists particularly uh, because she didn't see, it wasn't all about, you know, beautiful buildings to her. It was about the dynamic cellular uh, 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 activity of neighborhoods. It was about the messiness of community life and uh, the rich ecosystem that occurs in environments and that that was worth saving that that is worth protecting. And that when you start to chip away at that, you, you destroy the very uh, foundational pillars of community. And that has, she has prescient, it, that has been proven out time and again and again and again. And, uh, and uh, I think that uh, it is a, uh, continues to be a warning uh, you know, to all of us that have a voice and influence uh, design and planning decisions. And uh, um, the protection of uh, historic fabric um, the, uh, uh, the protection and support of the activities that exist there today, um, uh, uh, an appreciation for adaptive reuse and how buildings can, can take on new, new, uh, new uses uh, and learn and grow along with us. All of that uh, is uh, an essential part of what uh, Jane was seeing uh, and talking about. And of course, she was a great, a great activist uh, in New York City 
uh, taking on Robert Moses and uh, doing really important work. We wouldn't have a Greenwich Village if it weren't for, uh, for Jane Jacobs. I knew you were going to say Robert Moses, possibly the, the biggest boogeyman in historic preservation in New York City history, and deservedly so, in my opinion. Um, but the thing is, I think it's important as well that you said that I want to get back to, which is her idea of organic conception and how um, communities are messy and they're not always pretty. Because I think what the historic preservation movement maybe was hijacked or maybe is seen inappropriately as a place that only as an organization, as a movement that only preserves big houses with incredible collections in them and everything is presented in a very pristine environment. And I think Jane Jacobs, as you know, is still controversial today. And I very think so. it's important to realize that that vision, and, and I think the, the, the um, Me Too movement and, and the woke movement are hopefully pushing this along further is to say, Every kind of preservation doesn't have to be pretty, doesn't have to be big, doesn't have to be shiny. It tells a story like the Tenement Museum, for instance. And this is much more adapted, I find, in the UK than it is here, embracing these kinds of stories and saying, this is a part of the story too. It's not always pretty, and that's the story. Well, the first period houses in historic New England's collection are obviously very, very important to the full arc of, of, uh, of New England history. I think that the... Um, uh, uh, and also community context. Uh, it isn't just the, the, the structure itself or the landscape that we steward, but it's also the broader community and what that community has been like, you know, obviously over time. I mean, some of the neighborhoods that our sites are in have gotten, if you will, better, and some of them have not uh, over, you know, over, over decades. And all of that is worth um, uh, considering, uh, needs to be thought about, uh, and uh, discovered uh, and shared. Uh, so um, I do think that um, uh, uh, the field is, is changing um, uh, at Columbia. Uh, the graduate school uh, is the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Uh, it has uh, become increasingly transdisciplinary. Uh, in the past, uh, preservation programs have been all about you know, architectural history and preservation and not about um, the other, uh, other considerations that we're talking about, I think there's been a, a great change in the last 10 years. I think students that are coming out of these programs now are, are, are thinking across these dip, disciplines and thinking most, more holistically about how to apply uh, their skills in preservation, their skills in uh, architecture and their skills in planning. So that, that gives, me some, uh, gives me some hope. Hope is what we all need. An anonymous attendee, <laughs> asks, are you seeking to support the preservation of historic religious facilities like churches and synagogues? Uh, you know, there is a, as, as we know, there is a sacred places um, uh, uh, preservation uh, framework uh, and uh, the protection of, of uh, sacred places, of uh, places of worship, um, of the civic um, uh, buildings uh, that have uh, been part of uh, community life is extraordinarily important. And, um, and preservation at the national level, I was once uh, with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, you know, has been, uh, and, and also at the regional level, certainly has shown great leadership uh, in the protection of, um, in, of churches and places of worship. There is amazing work going on right now all over the, the region. I mean, really stunning work all over the region. I just will give a quick shout out to the First Church in Roxbury. And uh, they are uh, undergoing uh, very extensive and have made um, uh, a tremendous progress, uh, you know, breathtaking community work there, uh, but also in the preservation of that ma majestic, magnificent uh, 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 church. So incredibly important area. One of my favoritely named charities in the UK is um, a group called the Friends of Friendless Churches. And this is a charity that buys deconsecrated churches the church in England can't maintain anymore, and they restore them. And they're, they're no longer, they're deconsecrated, so obviously there's no worship taking place there. But they present them as not so much museums, because they're, they're usually quite small, um, but just as little places for people to come and understand how people worshipped 400 years ago, 300 years ago, 200 years ago. And how, particularly in, um, in Britain in the 17th and 18th centuries, most people never left a 50 mile radius of the spot where they were born in their lives. So these churches were not just the center of community life, they were the center of community life, they were everything. And it would be a shame to lose these things. And I think 
you see a beginning uh, awakening of that here in America as well. Um, the best question that I have gotten today, I think, is from Margaret Jean, who asks, how old must a property be for your interest? Well, you know, the industry standard, so to speak, is 50 years. Uh, but um, uh, I actually don't think that really uh, applies in the sense of that um, this greater community focus that we're talking about to really look at the whole picture. Um, one of the um, initiatives we have under, we have a lot going on in historic New England. We are one very busy organization. And uh, 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 among the many initiatives that we have going is to really map uh, the, the assets around our historic sites. So really getting a much better understanding of what, um, uh, what, are, what makes these communities special uh, and, uh, and what's there today and what needs our attention. And that, does, that, isn't, that isn't restricted to just old buildings, obviously, that uh, um, the community context uh, uh, you know, cares about um, both old and new. And I think uh, uh, it's part of our responsibility to appreciate the whole of it as well as the singular um, uh, objects within it, uh, such as you know the most beautiful or the most historic, you know as we've been talking about. But um, you know to get on the national register and to be uh, sort of thought of as an important historic property, you've got to be you know at least fifty, which is feeling very young, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> every day that feels younger. Um, Margaret Jean has just come back with a reply and actually another question, which I think is also great. She says that we still own and live in a property that has been in my family since 1733. Wow. Fabulous. And wonder what interest you have in those still privately owned properties. We have offered the house and barns for local fundraising tours. Well, I mean, our interest is uh, a very keen. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> the largest preservation easement program in the country. Uh, and uh, we're uh, 116 properties in, uh, in New England. Um, um, uh, have uh, historic New England preservation easements uh, on them. And uh, obviously um, uh, these preservation easements are a great tool to protect the integrity of these properties and in perpetuity. Um, you know, I think that the, um, uh, we're very committed um, to, the, to the full range and span of, of, um, of building types uh, in New England. Uh, um, our collection is a little weighted in, you know, one category, uh, but, but uh, uh, certainly our intentions as we move along and it doesn't have to, we don't have to own it. I mean, um, uh, expanding our uh, footprint, if you will, uh, can come through collaboration and partnership. So of course we have great interest. Karen has a very interesting question. She wonders if it's possible to link the preservation of historic burying grounds, tombstones and monuments that are close to your properties or on your properties and make that part of the fuller story of the property. Yes, and we, uh, you know, again, a wonderful question and uh, area of work, and we, we are doing some of that. And, uh, and so uh, the, the um, historic cemeteries are obviously a very, very par important part of the landscape uh, protection uh, and responsibility for us. There are cemeteries, you know, on several of our properties. Patricia says that she visited years ago the Gropius House for an evening tour and felt that it was quite magical and wonders if you offer after daylight tours of other properties in historic New England's portfolio. Well, of course, in the last year and a half, uh, you know, there haven't been, um, there, uh, it hasn't been a very innovative time for in-person uh, uh, site tours. Uh, over the summer, uh, we had 28 sites out of 38 open. Uh, last year, we only had six open uh, during the summer. Uh, and by the way, all of our tours were sold out and have been sold out uh, since, uh, since they uh, opened. But we, um, you know, we, re we really do believe in activating these places and uh, finding imaginative, engaging ways to uh, connect people to the sites. And so um, twilight tours, um, you know, going in with the lights off and flashlights uh, for, like Give Me House in Salem, which is so cool. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there are so many uh, possibilities and we are uh, very committed. And I think our visitor experience uh, team, which is excellent, uh, is uh, always thinking about these things. And we all can't wait uh, until um, we don't have to think about uh, the protocols that have limited um, what we've been able to do. This is a real far field um, response for me, but I'm going to say for those of you who actually like the idea of Twilight Tours, the ultimate tour 
of one of the most amazing historic houses, I think, in the world is Dennis Seaver's house in the Spitalfield section of London, which doesn't have electricity in it. So it's not even possible to have artificial light. And you can take day tours and night tours, and you have to book them in advance, even before COVID, this was the case. I really recommend taking a nighttime tour. The whole place is lit by candles and um, their floors by gas lights, especially at Christmas time when the house is decorated for Christmas. And it just shows you how magical a house can be when you see it as it would have been seen by the people who live there, because that's something else that I think is important to talk about with historic properties and even art hanging on museum walls, which is that these people didn't live with this stuff with halogens shining on it. They lived with it with very low light and oftentimes art, furniture, mirrors particularly were designed to be seen by candlelight and to see them in their native setting is a whole different experience. Bill says that Boston is the home of a wide variety of preservation and conservation organizations, all facing similar tough issues. Racial diversity, inclusion, climate change, keeping community character, are all you organizations talking to each other? Uh, well, yes. I mean, I think that, um, and we, we need to do more talking. Um, it, um, uh, it, it really is about, it isn't, these are not throwaway terms to me. I mean, it, this really is about collaboration and partnership. We're right now demonstrating that um, by our organizations joining together. And I think that, um, you know, we in the field have to do a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more partnering up uh, to, really, uh, to really do the job. Uh, I've referenced a few times uh, the new strategic plan at Historic New England, or, or uh, sometimes we refer to it as our strategic agenda. And uh, it is um, uh, posted on our website. Uh, we went through a very intensive uh, planning period over the last eight months. Uh, the, the plan uh, um, uh, is, uh, has been really adopted by the organization. And, and when you uh, review it, you will see uh, that uh, partnership is a very key strategy for us. And, uh, and we, we operationalize our thinking about that in great, in great detail with respect to our operating plans. So there's much underway and I think much to look forward to. And it's a very, very important uh, way in which we all need to um, uh, go about how we get all of this done. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions today. I just want to say that it's amazing to think of what historic New England has come through, not just the last 100 years, but in the last 10 years, and how lucky we all are to have enlightened management in historic New England that I think is really shining a very bright way for the future of historic preservation in all its permutations. If you have other questions that we did not answer today, you are welcome to email us at heritagetours at nehgs.org, and we will answer them as quickly as we can. I also want to mention that we have a number of upcoming events at New England Historic Genealogical Society that I would like to bring to your attention. The first one is on October 28th, when we have our fall family history benefit honoring Mary Beth Norton. And then just a day later, speaking of tombstones, we have our own David Lambert, our head genealogist, who will be giving a walking tour of the Granary and King's Chapel burying grounds. On November 5th, I will be hosting the eminent um, curator Tom Mickey, just recently retired from the MFA, when he gives a lecture entitled The Impact of the China Trade on New England Architecture. And then finally, on November 12th, I will be hosting Jennifer Melville, who is a curator at the National Trust for Scotland, an organization that is really coming to terms with its slave owning past. And she has a lecture called Addressing the Legacies of Slavery and Empire at the National Trust for Scotland Properties. Thank you again so much to everybody for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and very much appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more programs for you and others to enjoy. Stay safe, stay safe, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you soon again on our future online, online programs. Goodbye for now.